now is that is that better it is better indeed <laughs> fantastic you. all right thank you everybody i appreciate that omar so we're going to be starting here soon it's the top of the hour uh we have over 250 people registered for this event so this was clearly a hot topic um, and thank you for registering and thank you for those of you who are attending live uh today's guest presenter is amar ahmad am i pronounced ahmad am i pronouncing that correct Good. Okay. Of Sigma Risk. He's joining us from the UK. Uh, for anybody who has joined any of our uh, past webinars, you may have heard Amar speak in the in the past. Uh, he spoke on trade-based money laundering, and I do recall being blown away. That was a really good webinar back then. And you also joined us last uh, year about this time on country risk. So again, I, I welcome you back and thank you very much for uh, joining us to talk about uh, risk rating methodology. Um, a little bit of housekeeping before we begin, and then what I'm also going to do is uh, ask a couple of poll questions so we get to understand who is listening in, and we can maybe adjust some of our questions um, and our, our presentation to you. So again, today's guest presenter is Amar Ahmad of Sigma Wrist in the UK. Uh, just so you know, Amar is a certified, uh, he's with the International Compliance Association, he is a certified uh, tutor with them. Uh, and again, he's a very good uh, uh, speaker and teacher. He's also a financial crime uh, compliance consultant. Uh, he does have a lot of very large uh, and well-known brands uh, as his clients. And he's uh, throughout, uh, through many countries too, you know, not just there in the UK. So a very global perspective from Amar. Um, my name is Kimberly Smith. I'm a co-founder of Silo Compliance System. It's based in the Cayman Islands, although I'm based in the US. Uh, I'm also a former compliance officer in MLRO. I lived in London uh, for a while doing that role, playing that role, and have a lot of frontline um, kind of sat in the hot seat like many of you are. Uh, today's, uh, for, if you're attending the live event today, uh, it is, uh, you will get a certificate. It's automated, so you will get that in, in about an hour after the event. I just want to remind everybody, too, this is not legal advice, and our opinions are our own, of course. Uh, we expect the length of the presentation to be about half an hour. We understand your time is very valuable. Uh, we'll then give about 15 to 20 minutes for a little bit of Q&A, and of course, Amar has um, a tool that he uses that he'll be, and I think created, um, and he'll be explaining that a little bit uh, to, to those as well. And then, of course, we will take some Q&A at the end. Um, Amar, I'm going to go ahead and do, do a couple of poll questions here, so just bear with me as I um, figure out all the technology behind the scenes here. It's always hard to do two things at once. So uh, our first uh, poll question is a very easy one, and that's just how did you hear about us? And I would very much, uh, Amar, can you see that? Um, let me know if you can see that screen. Yeah, it looks like everybody's answering. And uh, we just want to make sure our marketing is getting to, to everybody and it, it's working well. And again, I won't um, uh, take too much time. I'm going to close this in about uh, five more seconds and um, then move on to the next one, which is really asking about you and your roles. All right, so I'm going to close this poll. It looks like most of you got... Um, referred or by email. So thank you very much for answering that. Uh, the next question is, um, what industry do you work in? I'm going to launch this. Now our options here are banking, advisory, so such as a, maybe a law firm or accounting firm or wealth manager, perhaps. Uh, the other option is corporate services or trusts insurance companies I know and then of course there I've got other in there so if you're in the real estate or hospitality or some other uh, regulated industry or other industry maybe you're a student at a college for instance or you're a professor uh, go ahead and hit other uh, but this is kind of again so we kind of know who our audience and it looks like it's quite um, equal right now I'm getting about a 30 percent baking 20% uh, advisory 40% corporate services or trust 4% insurance and 10% other. Okay, so I'm going to close that now and share with you those results so you can see who is also listening in. And the next poll question, 
I'm going to hide that one. The next poll question, what level of compliance responsibility do you have? Uh, so this again, we just want to know what your uh, your strength is. So board level, are you a, just a direct manager of compliance? Are you just a compliance support staff? Sorry, I won't say just. That's um, that's a very important role. Um, I'm asking if you have like three plus years of experience. Are you entry level? Um, or do you have hybrid responsibilities? I know I personally work with a lot of people who are hybrid. Compliance is not their only job role. And uh, so they've got to manage the compliance and as well as other um, skill sets. So great. So this is fantastic. I'll give it another five seconds and then I'll close that poll. Um, fantastic. Thank you very much. Closing that and I'll share with you the results. And I'm sorry if you can hear all the sirens in the background. There must be fire emergency. Nothing I can do about that, unfortunately. Okay. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Looks like we have some uh, about just under 30% board level senior management, 28% hybrid, and 23% uh, are com experienced compliance staff. And again, thank you very much for joining us today. What I'm going to do now is uh, hand over the presentation to um, Amar so he can share his screen. Are you ready, Amar? I'm going to make you presenter. Absolutely. Thank you. Fantastic. Take it away. Here. Oh, sorry. I think I might have to hide that. There we go. Okay. I'm going to share my screen. Uh, please let me know when you can see my screen. I can see your screen. Yes. And Brilliant. I can hear you. Okay. Um, here we are. Um, just to confirm, you can see the screen with Sigma Client Risk Assessment Webinar. Is that the screen yes. you can see? Yep. Okay, brilliant. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, um, uh, thank you everyone for, for joining the webinar today. It's, it's an absolute um, honor to be speaking to all of you um, once again. And um, um, Kimberly, um, a big thanks to you as well for, for making the arrangements and um, um, again, giving all of us an opportunity to actually come and talk to each other and learn from each other. So um, the topic today is 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 a very interesting one um, about the client risk assessment, um, and uh, um, the, I'm thinking about around uh, I think 20 minutes, 20 25 minutes, uh, we will talk about some of the key features of uh, an effective risk assessment framework. What should it include, or how should it really operate? What the key features um, should be, and then I will walk you through. Um, another um, another 15 minutes or so on on a live risk rating methodology as to how um, you know um, an automated risk rating methodology should look like. So um, just uh, giving you an introduction about um, myself. Um, those who who, who haven't um, you know known me. So um, myself, I'm I'm the managing director of the Sigma Risk. So we we are UK based. Um, um, institution, but our exposure has been uh, predominantly uh, truly global over the last few years. A um, number of our clients uh, who have benefited from um, you know, our services you know, in the Far East, in the Middle East, in Africa, in Europe, and in America as well. And some these, this is, uh, you can see some of the clients that um, Selective, who we have recently uh, delivered uh, some of the projects. Uh, some some big names, small names, um, you know, some of the energy clients like of the British Petroleum, some of the regulators like Malta Financial Services Authority, financial institutions like Standard Chartered BNP, um, private banks, Lombard Otier, and also uh, International Compliance Association. In With International Compliance Association, our actually um, relationship is a lot more than that. So I am myself um, a faculty member of ICA. So um, I do do teach on behalf of ICA um, as well. Um, we, we do teach a number of um, courses, including certificates, advanced certificates, diploma, and professional postgraduate diploma level qualifications. So um, other than that, Sigma Risk, we are actually partner of ICA as well in multiple countries, um, including um, um, Malta, India, Pakistan, Nigeria, um, etc. So that is a little bit of a background about um, Sigma Risk. Myself, I've, be, I've been a consultant um, focusing on financial crime compliance um, since last 
12, 13 years. Um, I have worked with a number of clients all over the world and the focus has predominantly been on the financial crime and compliance. So what we're we discussing today, so um, client risk assessment, that the hot topic these days, and what we will talk about within the client risk assessment as to what really a client risk assessment is. Okay, and um, question arises, why do we really need to perform a risk assessment? Why do we need to risk rate our clients? Okay, what, what value does it add? And also, um, we talk about primary versus secondary risk pillars. I will explain a little bit further when we get into the stage on this particular slide as to what is the difference between primary and secondary risk pillars. And then second part of um, the session today, we will talk about risk assessment methodology. Okay, what should a, a risk methodology look like? Um, what should be the key attributes? Okay, automation, should we do automation? Should we not? If it, we do, what the benefits, drawbacks, etc. And then at the end, I will briefly um, talk about the Sigma AML risk calculator which is our, um, our built-in uh, methodology that we've devised at Sigma Risk. Okay, um, now going to the topic of client risk assessment. So th there are a number of things that we should, we, we should know about our clients, okay? Uh, our clients, at the end of the day, any business has one aim to, to actually generate revenues for the key stakeholders. And the, the, the key source of revenue is, of course, our clients. Although we do get the financial benefit of dealing with our clients, that does bring us some obligations as well. That we need to make sure that we are dealing with the legitimate clients. Okay? And uh, each type of client, um, they may bring different type of challenges, different type of uh, risk that might be associated. So we need to take a step back and think about um, our, our framework our thought process as to how are we going to risk assess our clients. Some of the questions that we should be talking about, who our client is, that is the starting point, okay? Knowing who they are, verifying them who they are, who owns them, et cetera. Um, and what do they really do? That is a very important question. Um, and I will talk a little bit more in detail in the coming slides. Um, the who is definitely knowing who owns, who controls, who runs, who is really at the background. This is some fundamental question that we should be asking about our clients. And what do they really do? That plays a significant role in the overall risk profile of a client. That the type of activities do they engage in and the type of industry they become part of, et cetera. Where are they based? Where are they incorporated? Where are they generating their money from? Okay. Where are they operating from? fundamental questions. This day and age, we may have a client, for example, could be incorporated in the UK, but they might be generating all of the revenue from Angola. Quite possible. We may have a client based in, in Germany, but all of the directors could be based in China. We may have a client based in USA, that's the country of incorporation, but all of their ultimate beneficial owners could be from Russia. This day and age, everything is possible, right? So we really need to understand the bigger picture for client. And also, um, you know, um, the client, one key factor about understanding a client from a risk assessment perspective, how do they generate their money from? How do they generate their revenue? Okay. Overall risk assessment is not only identifying the individuals on the back of a client, it's also identifying their activities and their source of funds the source of wealth, etc. That becomes part and parcel, which we call it how. Why would a client like to do business with us? What value that a client is expected to get from a business relationship with us as a client, as, as a financial institution, for example, and um, what kind of challenges that may bring over to us? Okay, the why is a very important question as well. And you know, whether any negative news, any political exposure, court cases, sanction alerts, bribery, corruption, et cetera, et cetera. So this is um, you know, um, the key fundamental questions that I, I suggest that we should be asking uh, when we are performing a risk assessment of a client. Who they are, what do they do, where are they based, how do they make the money, why they do want to build a relationship with us, and whether there is any 
um, special risks which are associated with the client. Okay, and then also at this time and age, um, why do we really need to perform a risk assessment anyway? Why can't we simply go ahead and take a client on board and start doing business? We're there to do business, so why do we have to perform risk assessment? Of course, there is there is enhanced regulatory focus. Okay, and uh, the governments are involved now. Every government wants to know as to um, how the industry operates. This is for the ultimate benefit um, for the government as well. And media is, is, is a very important, um, I would say, key stakeholder that has emerged over the last few years. Talking about Panama Papers, talking about you know, um, Paradise Paper or WikiLeaks, all these kind of you know the big scandals that we have seen over the last few years. Um, media has played a significant role, and the way the things have been presented in media that has actually jolted the markets the, the, the even that has actually forced the regulators to actually you know get stringent in, in their expectations as well and also very important from the senior management perspective okay so the, now um, like I'm, I'm sure there will be um, similar um, approaches in other developed markets as well but i'll give you an example of my home market in uk we have smcr senior manager certification regime which makes the senior management accountable for any um, any wrongdoing that a firm may do um, either deliberately or by mistake okay so the fact previously it used to be you you know doesn't matter if you have you know a really good controls in place or not the maximum wrong something could go would be the uh, institution may get a fine but now the the consequences have actually advanced from on an institution level more on a personal level as well. Now, MLROs, heads of compliance, CEOs, CFOs, they could be actually sent to prison if they do not do the job properly. Okay, so there is a very a big focus now to to truly understand the risks which are associated with our clients. And also, I think that is a more of a regulatory perspective. Very important here is social perspective. Okay, we at the end of the day um are the ultimate stakeholders for any effective framework within a country if as an institution if we are unable to play our role to um to identify you know illicit activities identify illicit financial transactions you know these are the things which are going to impact us at the end of the day okay, fraud that impacts us human trafficking impacts the society Okay, if tax evasion, we've seen many, many countries, especially like you know, in the third world countries who are rich, rich from the resource perspective, but there is a poverty, okay, because the rich don't pay taxes. Bribery and corruption at the end of the day, the same outcome, which is not a very positive one for the general members of the society and acts of terrorism as well. You know, unfortunately, if we are unable to uh, identify or detect a client who might be facilitating funding of terrorism, the consequence that literally on the society as well. So overall, the, we need to look into the bigger picture, in my opinion. When we are conducting a risk assessment, it is very important that not only we take into consideration the, the, the regulatory perspective, but also the social perspective on us as well. What happens if we don't do it correctly? Here is, here is the news, Standard Chartered recently Okay. they've been fined 102 million pounds and the reason you can see it highlighted as well because they failed to effectively perform customer due diligence not getting a customer due diligence right that can have severe consequences on an organization level as well and then the, the key fundamental thing that we should be thinking about if we are performing a customer risk assessment or client risk assessment are we doing it correctly that is the main thing, right? So uh, it is no value to have um, a, a risk rating methodology in place if it does not do justice with the spirit of the, the task that we, we're trying to achieve. So the consequences could be, could be quite severe. Now let's talk briefly about um, what does a risk rating methodology looks like, okay? The, in my opinion, um, I can split the key risk parameters into primary and secondary risk pillars. From the primary, what I mean, such risk parameters which are going to be associated with each and every client. 
no client is going to be exempt from primary risks and the secondary ones they are related to i would say client to client situation to situation so um, that is important for us to, to to perform the distinction as to what are the primary and what are the secondary so what could be the primary risk pillars client risk client itself if a client exists client risk exists okay when the client was incorporated who they are who own them who control them etc okay so when there is a client relationship client risk exists by itself country risk every client has to be incorporated and in and operating at least in one country or maybe multiple countries okay so the country risk is something that we cannot say that is not applicable for one of our client the country risk is always going to be there okay industry risk again at the end of the day every client will be part of some industry could it be financial institution industry could it be you know oil and gas energy industry could it be betting gaming gambling could it be you know retail could it be you know fast moving consumer goods it could be has to be part of some industry okay so industry risk is going to become part and parcel of every client and then product every client will require some product or service from us so that is again another primary risk in my opinion okay so these four risks no client is going to be exempt from these four risks so we need to make sure that we understand each of these primary risk pillars and we have an effective mechanism in place to allocate reasonable ratings and weightings to the primary risk let's talk about secondary risks which will be dependent upon client to client for example okay pep risk politically exposed person risk okay not every client will have a politically exposed person involved in the control framework or a control structure okay so that risk will vary client to client some client might present pep risk some clients might not present pep risk but again this is a risk which we should or we, we should definitely consider in our risk rating methodology negative news risk again adverse media negative news different terminologies which are used all over the world again very important that again this is not going to be part and parcel of every client some clients might have adverse news or negative news some may not have it but still it is a risk that should be in the in the overall um, you know methodology that that every um, institution should have to risk assess their clients sanctions risk again i will call it a secondary risk some clients may be exposed to sanctions some may not be but very important risk to take into consideration bribery and corruption again a secondary risk pillar um, same thing sometime there might be exposure sometime there might not be so i split uh, the basic eight fundamental risks there, there are more risks as well but fundamentally i would say these are the eight risk factors which must become part and parcel of a client risk rating methodology and then depending upon our products and services our exposure geographical exposure our industry exposure etc we may want to enhance the the methodology with additional risk factors as well Okay, and now the next section, a uh, risk assessment methodology. A good methodology, what should it include? Automation, okay? Um, this time and age, things move so quickly, very quickly, okay? Um, and then if we, if you are still relying upon kind of, you know, an Excel-based methodology, looking into kind of, you know, a paper-based methodology, we are not going to catch up with the pace of change that is happening all the time automation is key standardization removing the i would say you know the the sometimes human bias i would say you know if if we do not have a standard standardized methodology i may risk create a client in a particular way someone sitting next to me according to their own understanding they might risk create a client differently okay there, there must be a standard criteria of uh, of client risk assessment this is something the regulators are very particular about. They want to see standardization because that is something that enables them to, to measure the effectiveness of a good risk assessment framework of, uh, of, of an institution. Suitability, does it really suit our business model? 
does it really suit our products and services does it really suit um you know the industry be part of it okay so as i mentioned so depending on the industry we might need to modify our research methodology as well it should be comprehensive it should be shouldn't rely only on one or two or three risk factors we should be looking into risk from every possible angle okay it should be smart it should be able to uh, modified amended enhanced okay uh, that is the key thing for, for um, a methodology. And for another angle that I take from the smart perspective is that a good methodology should not uh, be kind of you know, manipulated by only one risk factor to derive the overall risk profile of a client. It should take into consideration various risk factors and how do they correlate in different um, environments. I will explain um, a little bit more on the smart um, aspect of a good methodology as well bad methodology if you get a risk rating methodology i call it bad methodology if it's not working fine number one we will get incorrect risk rating we get incorrect risk rating we will have an incorrect level of due diligence if you have incorrect level of due diligence we will perform incorrect level of verification okay because the verification of the for example id and v or a documents that mostly depends upon the risk score of a client if you get the risk score wrong we will apply a wrong level of verification and then also that may result into incorrect level of transaction monitoring that we apply sometime for a higher risk client we we want to monitor every transaction for a lower risk client we may want to monitor transaction that only fall in a particular category for example okay one solution does not fit every situation but again it is very fundamental thing if we get our risk rating methodology wrong everything that we're going to do further on that will be wrong okay and if we get a methodology is not giving us the correct output it means our clients will be on incorrect risk review cycle as well very commonly known in the industry various financial institutions and even corporates these days they review their client risk every one two three four or five years depending upon the risk profile of the client so if we have incorrectly risk created a client say as a as a low risk but actually they present a high risk then we are reviewing them after three or five years where act whereas actually we should be reviewing them every year just just an example okay so the consequences of getting a risk rating risk methodology wrong they are actually quite severe as well okay now last is um sigma risk um you know aml risk calculator which we've devised which is based upon um, very sophisticated algorithms so this is what what i have just discussed um the years and years of my experience we've tried to bring it into a live methodology to make it standardized to make it work for um for anyone who want to uh, take benefit from um for, from this methodology which has been designed and tested by the experts you can see that um, on the screen as well the key risk pillars primary and secondary risk pillars that we have actually um, included here so in, including the incorporation date how long a client has been incorporated incorporation country where are they incorporated operating where are they operating where they're generating the revenue from type of entity what type of entity are they i will explain a little bit more when we uh, give a demo and uh, if they are regulated or listed then which country are they regulated or listed what part of industry um, are they in what products if we offer to a client and um, if we offer the multiple product then how do we deal with it politically exposed um, connections negative news layers of ownership bearer nominee shares um, and also ultimate beneficial owners where are they from, et cetera. So I will go through the methodology in in next couple of minutes. But this is just an overview of how um, we have actually built this particular risk methodology. Okay, and then um, just wanted to um, also share that, um, again, in, in, a mat in a matter of, you know, half an hour, 20, 25 minutes, half an hour, it is literally impossible for us to, to, to kind of, you know, share the you know the knowledge that we want to share so um, if anyone um, is ever interested to, to know more about how to build a risk rating methodology or how to perform a risk assessment from anti-money laundering financial crime risk assessment perspective then we do have an aml risk assessment masterclass which is a full day masterclass 
which is offered by Sigma Risk, and which we currently we are delivering um, virtually, um, either through Zoom or, or, or Team. But uh, in the future, um, once the restrictions for the travel are actually taken off, we we, we will resume the in-house delivery of these master classes as well. And on our website, you can see actually uh, the full introduction about the master class, what we're trying to achieve, the key learning objectives, the course outline that gives us the full outline as to what are we going to be discussing in, in a full day master class and what we expected to, to learn from it. Okay, now question and answers. So I will park this particular slide for a second because what I wanted to um, go through first was the, the demo of the risk rating methodology, and then we will come back to the question and answer. Is that is that okay, Kimberly? Yeah, absolutely, that's fine. And I do have about three questions. Um, and I do want to encourage everybody, use the question panel uh, to pose your questions, and I'll be reading uh, from them to present them to um, Amar um, after his quick demo here, so. Thank you. Okay, um, uh, Kimberly, can you please confirm if you can see my screen again? I can the, see the your methodology? screen. Yeah, absolutely. Fantastic. Okay, so I, I'm going to give a very um, brief demo here. Um, so the way we, we have constructed this methodology is to is to bring standardization, is to bring reliability in what we do. And comes um, you know a regulatory visit, we will have all the standardized information for each and every client of ours um, saved as a PDF into our client file. So the way it works. So you can see that um, each of the, the key risk pillars that we have included in our uh, methodology, there is a risk bar. So each risk bar uh, presents the, the associated risk with a particular client in terms of each risk parameter. And there is an overall risk bar that you can see on, on the right hand side that shows the overall risk of a, of a client. So these ones, these, these horizontal bars, represent the risk against each parameter and then this this particular bar that will show the overall risk okay so give it an example so um we for example if you are onboarding a client who was only incorporated say yesterday that, that happens a lot okay so you will see that suddenly that particular risk um pointer that has moved all the way to the right okay, why would it happen we know that if a client has been incorporated yesterday most probably, and actually, they, 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 there isn't any history of the client to take us comfort from. Okay, there is, there won't be any audited financials, etc. Okay, there wouldn't, wouldn't be any business or transaction history the way we could take them comfort from. So that presents the highest level of risk if a client has only been incorporated um, yesterday, for example. But if they were being incorporated in 2001, for example, you will see the risk has moved back all the way. To the green if the client has been in the business for 20 years it means they would be a legitimate business from at least from um, from from the business perspective they've been in the industry for 20 years that adds a value of comfort for us and then the next risk factor for example we talk about is where a client is incorporated that is a very important factor so to talk about say if we say the client is incorporated in united states okay so you see that the risk bar has moved to the right a little bit but still in the green zone one important factor that we we have introduced we have algorithms that um, give us a real life information about each country where our client is working for example united states as of now right today the transparency international has ranked usa 25 out of 180 which is a really good rating i would say so the one mean the least corrupt country and 180 means the most corrupt country in the world okay so for example a client is based in the united states now the next question could be where are they generating the revenue from so i'm just going to put some random um, countries here just to give us an idea as to um you know what, how does this methodology operate so okay so for example if they are operating from uh, malta they the client is based in malta and they generate 50 percent of their revenue from Malta, you will see that the overall risk of the client has gone a little bit up. It was right at the bottom there, but has gone a little bit up. Why is that? We click on this I, and you can see today the Malta has been included into the gray list today. 
So this methodology is in a live mode. Okay, so the announcement has been made today. The Molta is on the gray list and straight away our algorithms have picked it up and told us, hey, Molta has been included in the FATF gray list. And it actually happened only maybe I think three hours ago. Okay, so that is a, a very, um, I think, a groundbreaking algorithm that we have brought in to give a very um, accurate live information to our clients. So nobody really need to update the country risk every three months, six months, a year or two years. Everything is updated in a live environment. You can see the Transparency International on the top has ranked Malta uh, 2052 out of 180. So even from the bribery and corruption perspective, Malta hasn't been doing really well. Okay, so the, from the fact of membership perspective, the third point you can see they're member of the money wall and they're not included in the EU third country, uh, the high risk third country list. And then Basel index of Malta is 5.48, which is actually the lowest in whole of the Europe. And the OECD has given them a score of zero. Zero actually means a lower risk. From, but the, the point is that different sources that we take into consideration while calculating a country risk, they have a different background. For example, Transparency International predominantly focuses on bribery and corruption. A financial action task force mostly focuses on the crime related to general financial crime, anti-money laundering, terrorist financing, etc. Okay. OECD looks into different other risks, you know, political risks, barriers to entry, ease of doing business, etc. etc. So our country risk is not skewed or derived by only one risk factor. I have seen many institutions making big mistake of just downloading the Transparency International list, list, um, uh, risk kind of a list and using it as their country risk, which is wrong. Because the Transparency International, their main focus is actually on bribery and corruption. They don't really um, give uh, any high weighting to other type of financial crime as well. Okay, so say 50% risk um, operation is coming from Malta, and then another 50% um, um, revenue is being generated from um, say United Kingdom. You click on United Kingdom, you add 50%, and you will see that the risk has moved a little bit more. Okay, now another point that um, I want to bring it here is that um, generating a revenue in a country, um, it can be interpreted in two different ways. One way is, um, is it a country where we are just generating some revenue from where we are not present at all or where our client is not present at all. For example, if you know, uh, I am dealing with a client who are based in UK, but they generate half of their revenue from um, Angola, for example. If they have a branch in Angola, that adds a, a, a matter of comfort as well because they are physically present on the ground in Angola. They would understand the culture the the regulatory landscape in a much better way compared to if they were not present in angola at all so local presence so if there is another functionality that we have it here so if uh, our client is operating in say top five countries if they generate 50 percent of revenue for malta if they are physically present in malta as well if you click the button okay, you will see the risk will come down it means that the risk is reduced when we have a presence in a country where we are generating some revenue from. Type of entity, again, what type of entity we're talking about? A charity will provide, will kind of expose to different risk level compared to a hedge fund or a pension fund or a regulated financial institution, okay, or a special purpose vehicle. Okay, you click SPV, you have seen that the attribute for risk for this particular in entity type, this kind of, you know, in towards orange to red, overall risk has gone up as well compared to if we would have selected, for example, um, you know, a, a regulated financial institution, and you will see the risk has come down again. Okay. This is what I meant by smart. Okay. So things should be taken into perspective. And now talking about regulated financial institution, another thing, if they're regulated in United States, that is different compared to if they were regulated in Mauritius. Okay. Just being regulated, does not mean that the, the risk is mitigated. So we can we can see that here. So if if a client is um, regulated in USA, you'll see the risk hasn't moved much. But if I change and I say that if they are regulated in Mauritius, you'll see the risk has moved up further. 
if you click on i it tells you why it has moved up because mauritius they are not only included in the eu third uh, high risk third country list but also they are they are listed by the fatf as a gray list country as well okay so i'll move it back to a low risk country say united kingdom for example you see the risk has come back industry what type of industry are we are we dealing with that is very important as well so the different type of industry say it could be something with the petroleum ex extraction of crude petroleum industry as an industry is a higher risk industry um, many reasons um, most of the at home we would see the extraction of crude that must be that coming from either middle east or africa or um, russia these kind of countries which are generally um, highly exposed to bribery and corruption so as an industry that pose um, a higher risk as well okay so also if a client our client be dealing with if there are a charity for example that pushes the risk a little bit higher you can see that when it's like charity the risk is moved even higher okay and if we say um, if there is a central government okay there risk come down that is what we mean by by a smart methodology product fine we we know where the client is based which industry are they in are they regulated are they listed yes or no and another question is what do we do with them that is important okay. offering for example if we offer a client um you know um foreign exchange as a product i add it as a product so foreign exchange is basically a uh, considered as a low risk offering to a client money is already in a financial system someone's already got us dollars they just want to convert it into um, euros or sterlings perfectly fine what they can do is that um they, they can um convert it that that's perfectly fine no issue at all but if we are offering say cash management collecting cash on behalf of our clients if you add cash management you'll see the risk will go up so having a product only um, that can change the overall risk profile as well each product they carries particular type of risk um, inheriting risk i would say within a product say talking about um, a documentary trade finance you add documentary trade finance the risk is pushed up again taking into consideration that our client is um, operating generating revenue from a higher risk country which is in the gray list and we offer them cash management that will derive the overall risk more but what if the revenue generated from Malta was only five percent um if it was only five percent instead of 50 should i make a change yeah it, it slightly brings it down if they were not locally present in Malta, that, that that makes small changes very small change that doesn't um it's not very much visible but it does make a change okay so um this is just trying to explain as to what does a smart risk rate methodology looks like? Now, question about uh, politically exposed individuals. Okay, so what a politically exposed relationship um, can 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 do to an overall risk of a client? For example, um, different type of um, if, if for example, if we have a client who does not have any pep at all, no politically exposed individual at all. Once I select no pep, it does not push the risk any higher or lower. Okay, but if I say there is a pep who is an ultimate beneficial owner, if I select that, you'll see that not only that this particular risk has moved right to the right side, but also we can see that um, the overall risk has gone quite high up because this is something that um, yeah, that, that that is kind of you know part and parcel of uh, of um, of an overall risk assessment um, where we have a PEP who's a UBO that present a higher risk and the regulators from all over the world, they recommend performing enhanced due diligence when we have a um, um, client, a, a politically exposed person who's the ultimate beneficial owner. What if, if the, the, the PEP was actually not a UBO, not an ultimate beneficial owner, they were just a politically exposed person because they had a role with the state-owned enterprise soe okay, that carries a different level of risk compared to if a politically exposed individual was the ultimate beneficial owner okay, so this is what I, I mean that we should take things into perspective identifying a pep should not trigger high risk rating straight away 
we need to be able to perform an assessment, a risk assessment, depending on what level of risk a politically exposed individual present to us. Okay, negative news. Okay, if there is no negative news, we don't see a change at all. But what if there was a negative news, maybe which had been proven and settled, something that happened like 20 years ago. Okay, if something happened 20 years ago, the, there might be a fine that has been paid. The firm has actually um, improved their policies, procedures, control framework. Still, there is an additional risk, but it doesn't really go right to the back. But what if there was a negative news which was recent and which is under investigation? You'll see that the risk has gone quite high up because we don't know what is going to be the, the outcome of the negative news. It's very important to perform an enhanced due diligence when we have a material negative news which is under investigation. So that is very important as well. Okay, so let me move it to um, a rather a low risk category here so that we, I, I, I main thing I want to sh show you is that how does the methodology work? So every time for if I move the trade finance product, okay, um, or cash management product, you'll see the risk comes back. So they keep adding the risk it is in a live environment. It take into consideration each risk. Layers of ownership, a very transparent, um, you know, ownership structure owned by one person or two persons, just one layer of ownership does not add any additional risk based on this particular factor. It still might be a high risk client, but here we are talking not only on overall risk perspective, but we risk rate each risk parameter on its own merit as well. Okay, so and also if you click on the I, the information, it tells you a background as to why do we think that um, what risk can be um, exposed to different layers of ownership. For example, if there was you know, more than five layers of ownership, okay, complicated, very complex structure, you will see that, that the overall risk has gone a little bit up as well, along with this particular risk for this particular um, risk pillar, layers of ownership, that's gone quite extreme as well. Bearer or nominee shares, not happened a lot of the time these days, but at the same time, I can, I can see that um, it, it, there are few countries uh, you can you can really count them on on, on your fingers who still permit um, issuing of um, bearer and nominee shares. So if there is a bearer and nominee share, criminal loves it. I would push the risk right to the to the maximum because if you're having a bearer share, anyone can hold the share and they become the ultimate beneficial owner. So there is no such control in place as such. So this is an important question that um, um, I, I always recommend that should be in part of the overall risk rating methodology. And also if you think that, if you say that there are um, say three UBOs, three ultimate beneficial owners in, in a company, um, and then let them, then, you know, where are they from? That's important. You know, if, if there is a one ultimate beneficial owner from Australia, you add a UBO, you see the risk hasn't really moved a lot. But if there was another one from say Russia, consider a higher risk country, especially when it comes to the ownership perspective, you'll see not only the, this risk from the UBO country perspective has gone a little bit higher, the overall risk has been pushed up as well. So you add another um, ultimate beneficial owner, say from Syria, just given an example, add UBO, gone to the maximum. Given the fact we have a PEP, politically exposed person as a director, and we are we have an ultimate beneficial owner who is from a sanctioned country you know what else are we looking for that, that of course adds the risk overall and at the end once we perform the risk assessment we, we've got all the information that we needed to we've we entered all the revenues it's not only um we we we, we take into consideration where a client is incorporated but also where are they generating the revenue from and according to depending upon how much revenue they're generating from different countries then we allocate the accordingly the, the appropriate risk score to the overall risk profile of the client at the end we can just click on generate the report and then what the report will do it will tell us everything in the real time we can save a copy keep in the client file and there we can actually see exactly how a risk um, assessment was performed, who performed it, the name of the, uh, which client we performed it for, which analyst 
perform that particular risk assessment and then there will be a time and date stamp along with the summary of all the um, answers that anyone has presented um, on the risk assessment so this is how this is what i mean by um, a risk assessment which is automated which is smart which is live which take into consideration um, every possible angle of the risk so that is all from from my end this is what i wanted to show you as to what we have built in terms of a risk rating methodology kimberly over to you okay fantastic i've got a few questions uh from the uh audience somebody was okay so just so you know somebody did ask a question that i think got answered about ubo country uh towards the end because you you were able to add the ubos um you were also uh, somebody else asked how do you determine the risk weighting of each of these factors is that uh, and that was a good question because i wanted to know as well because because of the different industries that we have uh so like corporate services for instance they might not care too much that somebody was incorporated yesterday because they are doing that incorporation so can they configure that um that weighting or, or remove it absolutely i think that this this is what i mean by smart okay mm -hmm. so the it, it, this is a general risk rating methodology but it can be modified for each client and it should be modified that's what i would say absolutely yeah okay? absolutely it should okay. be modified it need to do justice with the type of industry that you're operating in and then type of product and services that you offer so it, it should that is we we have constructed a framework and then when we talk to our clients who want to use our methodology, we sit with them and we talk to them and we ask them, tell us, what is your risk appetite? Where do you okay. do business? What do you think that should be the key risk parameters and where do you want to allocate higher rating of weighting? This is something we discuss with our clients. Great, so you can figure this for each of your clients. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay, okay. the other question I have, um, is about and of course and, and when it comes to the product i will say you know tell people please you know reach out to amar um and go to his website and you, i'm sure you could request a one-on-one -on -one demo to ask a lot of these questions um but i'm just trying to go to more of the whole just general questions as well um somebody asked about ubo countries do you consider place of birth and and i've actually had this question myself because uh, especially for for my wealth asset managers, uh, you might be dealing with a high net worth individual who was possibly born overseas in a in a, in a higher risk country, but they're really like a UK or UK or US national. Um, how, how do you recommend people always consider country of birth? I think it's, it's an interesting question, and the, the fact that it the answer shouldn't take only um, one approach whether country of birth should be taken as a one of the main thing or not it depends if you have any connection in the country of birth if you are generating some revenue from the country of birth as right. well so just uh, for example if i was i was born in in asia okay and uh, but i have moved here i'm a british citizen i generate my income from uk i pay my taxes in uk I am fully based in UK. Okay. Right. So for me, the country that should be considered is where I am operating, where I'm generating my revenue from. So country of birth could um, expose someone to a degree of sanctions risk, I would say. If someone, for example, is a citizen of a sanctioned country, the mm -hmm. sanctions is a very complex topic. So, um, and then again, if, if I, for example, if I am a UK citizen as well as I'm a, a Iranian or Syrian or North Korean citizen, for example, it is reasonable to know my my country of birth or if I have a dual nationality as well, because um, if, from the sanction perspective, you know, that, that may, uh, be a something good to have it but again if we come to the ratings i would give a much higher weighting to the country where i live to a country where i generate my income from to where i am based compared to where i was born yeah yeah so what usually what i kind of recommend is saying you know if you have those rare clients who do come from a who were born in a certain high risk country uh to go ahead and escalate it to your uh you know board or, or your risk committee and then have them say no this is mitigated you know 
that person was only born there. I actually have family members who were born overseas because uh, my father was in the military uh, and, and based overseas. So uh, that has actually impacted uh, my family as well. Uh, another question that I had is what if you operate in a high risk country? Um, you mentioned Malta uh, being on the gray list. What if you're operating there in Malta? Um, does that mean every single one of your customers and clients who are local also have to be high risk? How would you uh, modify your risk grading uh, methodology for that? This, this is a very, very important point. Um, so in co being incorporated in a country I is definitely a risk factor in my opinion. The, the real risk that lies is where do we do business? Where do we generate our income from? Okay, so that is the main thing. So it's very easy, as I mentioned, for um, a company to be incorporated in UK but being gener generating income from another country. So important thing is that that if we are generating revenue from a particular country, the the two things that we should take into consideration whether we are locally present in that country or not. If okay. we are locally present, I will give it a low risk rating because we are part of a local regulatory system. We understand the local risk. We understand the cultural, social, economical, regulatory risk in that particular jurisdiction. Then I would give it a lower risk if we are locally present there. But if we are just generating some income from a particular country, but we are not locally present there, okay, that is where I think a bigger risk lies because we are Kind of generating revenue remotely we just you know relying upon maybe partners or introducers or intermediaries in a particular country where we are generating some money from so i in, in my opinion um being incorporated in in a in a particular country is definitely important to know more important where we generate revenues from and even then where we generate revenue whether we are locally present or not the both of okay. them should be treated um in differently in my opinion Okay, great. Um, and somebody else also asked a really good question about uh, a company in liquidation. Uh, she said, uh, if a company is placed into court supervised liquidation, but prior to that date had links to PEPS, uh, should it uh, should it be deemed high risk or can it be standard risk as it is now under the court uh, the, the supervision of the courts? I think um, it's an interesting question, but again for for us to decide on on the overall risk of the client, we will need to look into other risk factors as well. Okay, so just a company having a politically exposed individual, I don't think that that should derive the overall risk of the client. Okay, so um, that shouldn't derive the overall risk of the client. So we should look into the bigger picture. We should look into other things. Okay, if we are, for example, onboarding a client who is currently in liquidation. We should be thinking about what we're really going to do with that client. They are in liquidation. They're going to be um, liquidated in maybe three, six, nine months a year. What product or services are we going to be offering them? What well, I think kind this of is kind of a key because what they're doing is they're actually dispersing funds to um, to to the creditors of that uh, company. So that's uh, I guess they might have to really think to in terms of what was the revenue source. Uh, of that company, kind of maybe you're, you're talking about the operation, you know, really look at the operation of the company before it went into liquidation and see how high risk uh, that was. I guess in my view, it wouldn't be so much about the directors being uh, peps or not, but if I was a liquidator, I'd want to look into what, where were the revenue sources of that company yeah. originally. That's... And why are we being liquidated? Is yeah, and why are they, yeah, is it for fraud, counting <laughs> issues? <laughs> exactly. Um, yeah, that's that's probably. I hope that answers uh, your question, Katie. Um, on okay, so Muhammad, you have a question, but I do think you need to go directly to Amar. Um, and yeah, and Chad, you too. You had to talk about just price and stuff, so that's fine. Just go directly to him. I'm trying to get the more general risk grading questions here. Um, okay, uh, yeah, same thing with Rochelle. She was wanting to ask about, you know, if, if it comes down a low bit for if they wanted to manually increase it. And I guess that was one of the questions I had about your product too, 
is uh, can you can you you got a state stamp of this? Will it notify you though? You do so. For instance, Malta went on the gray list today. What if yesterday I had onboarded somebody who was you know had uh, operation in Malta? Would I be notified today that Malta went on a gray list and now the that client is higher risk? Absolutely. So okay. that that is what that's I mean. You know, in automation in the technology. Everything is possible. So you ask and oh, we yeah. deliver. If you exactly. want to be notified, we de we deliver it to you. Yeah, that's what I tell people too with our with our system. It's kind of like you know, yeah, you, we could do anything. It's just a matter of how much do you want to pay for it. Um, <laughs> and that is a problem. And I will say, you know, that's that's one of that is understanding technology and all the system settings. It is stretching our compliance professionals and um, you can't just say now, well, that's an IT system, so it's IT guy's job because IT guys don't understand the, the, the details of compliance and compliance people are getting stretched trying to make sure they understand all the system settings uh, and what's going on behind the scenes. I do know my, I've got some users who are actually being, um, uh, it, they're under, you know, in, uh, what's it called, uh, you know, just their audits and, you know, the, the audit, the regulators are saying, now tell us, uh, you know, show us, prove that it is searching that sanctions list. And of course, and so that's part of our job is kind of help them, you know, make those, those proving. Uh, I know we're top of the hour, so I'm going to see if I can find a few more questions here that just uh, based on, um, let's see if we've got here. Uh, let me see. Um, oh, well, somebody I did ask. Do you think risk scoring attributes uh, attributes differ a lot for individuals versus entities? And I would think the answer to that is yes. Because absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. So it depends, you know, um, with, with the individuals. Again, I go back to my same opinion. So, being an individual or being an entity. That is one out of many risk parameters. What do we do with an individual? Mm -hmm. What we offer them? Who are they, where they're from, etc. So I, I wouldn't generalize it that, okay, in every situation, yeah, but it depends, you know, if, if there's a simple retail client, if we just kind of, you know, deposit some, you know, nominal amounts in, in our accounts, for example, may not present a higher risk, but again, our wealth structure, um, you know, and, um, and a beneficiary of a trust based in a tax haven, these kind of situation that will derive the overall risk. So, but yeah, I think in, in an individual, my personal opinion would be, um, it depends what we're doing with them. Okay. Okay. Simple uh, there's, yeah, there's a lot of questions about PEPs and I'm going to save those because um, we're actually doing a webinar next week uh, that, that's actually talking about PEPs. Uh, specifically, because those the PEPs is a, is another three day <laughs> webinar <laughs> alone. Um, so I think I've got most everybody. Sorry if I the the questions just came in, so uh, it just kind of piled in some. And I, I'm aware that we are at the top of the hour. I am going to um, show my screen again and uh, make myself presenter. So you can get the details for the next webinar that's going to be about. Um, sorry, everything, all the technology, here we go. Sorry, if you guys could see my screen. And I also have one more poll question, uh, if you if we can just bear with me as well. And that is just kind of asking if, uh, how, how we did today. Um, sorry, I'm not going to share that one, but I'm going to go after today's session. So after today's session, um, how, how do you feel about, uh, you know, do you think you're going to make some changes? Um, are, do you, are you comfortable with, with what you're gathering in your uh, current risk assessment processes? Or you're not really sure? Um, uh, or maybe it, it's, it's irrelevant to you if maybe you're a student or not. Uh, I think it's always good to kind of revisit uh, what we do just because it worked last year make sure we um, are very aware of, of, of what we're doing. Um, I, I do think too that the negative news and adverse media, that is also, uh, it's a, people go, well, I just Googled this person and he came up with some negative news on him. And one of the things that I look at always is, well, let's let's look at the that source. Uh, just because some, you know, especially when you're dealing with somebody from a different country, you don't know if um, that source is really a, a, a relevant 
um, and high quality source, or if it's just a, a kind of a trashy news of the world, you know, magazine who's just printing anything. So um, that's also stretching our uh, compliance uh, officers and compliance professionals, is they're having to know just a little bit of everything. Um, and, and this is where I always recommend, if you're not sure, you escalate it up to your senior management, escalate it up to your risk committees, um, and and let them kind of dig, you know, dig down and see what it is, uh, you know, or how what they're comfortable with. These are the people who are kind of the stakeholders and the owners of the business. So don't hesitate to to escalate things up. If you don't have your escalation procedures kind of really well written down, um, that is something you might want to, to visit in your policies and procedures. Okay, I'm going to close this and launch, and it looks like we've got about a 50, you know, 43% and 43% even um, uh, results there. Some saying that they're going to revisit uh, and make some improvements, and some saying that they are going to um, that that they're quite comfortable. Okay, um, and I'm just going to also again uh, visit with um, Amar directly. Uh, his his email is right here, and his website's there. And again, I just want to thank everybody again for joining us today. Our next webinar is next uh, Wednesday. Uh, we have Susan Grossi from the UK, and she is a fantastic writer, very humorous. Um, and she's going to be talking about some of those pep challenges that some of you, uh, many of you clearly are having. Clearly, clearly, peps are a huge problem right now. So, Amar, thank you again. Uh, for joining and thank you it's an honor, yeah. it's an honor to be on, on on this platform and um, again um, I'll just reiterate if anyone need any further information please feel free to reach out um, to me link with me on LinkedIn um, I, I believe um, uh, Kimberly she will send the copy of the handout as well um, the slides to yeah, all the, of slides, you and then, um, the yeah. slides are actually a handout uh, right now, so you might just want to look at your handouts. There's on your kind of little menu navigation bar, you should have a little section called handouts. There is one, and that is a copy of today's uh, slides. It's a copy of what uh, um, Amar has presented, and you're also going to get a follow-up email as well. Uh, that just kind of says thank you. You can there is a link there so you can sign up for Gray Matters uh, future webinars as well as next week's um, uh, webinar. And uh, for those who might just be listening uh, in and wanting a copy of the recording, we are going to send the recording. It takes you about three days to do all the technical stuff behind the recording, um, so that will be uh, going out hopefully by the by Friday. And uh, again, just thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Uh, this was a great session, Amar. Thank you so much for showing uh, what you created. Um, I think you, you'll probably get a lot of people interested in that because I do know things uh, like that are very much, um, very much under scrutiny right now. So again, thank you, thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Have a nice day, everyone. Thank you. Okay. Bye -bye.